Activate your voice. Fight for your rights. Speak up. Speak out. We're union and we're proud. Go union. Live from Maryland, this is Activate Live. Welcome to Activate Live, the Machinist Union's weekly show about organized labor and working people of North America. I'm Tanya Hutchins in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Today we're going to tell you why retirees rallied in Ohio yesterday and get the latest on the union coordinated bargaining committee negotiations with General Electric. But first, the IAM has reached a tentative deal for new contracts at Alaska Airlines. The contracts cover about 5,000 clerical, office, passenger service, reservations, ramp, and store workers. The tentative agreements prohibit outsourcing and increase base wages by an average of 14 percent. More information is available on the District Lodge 142 website. Well, it's day 15 of negotiations between the Union Coordinated Bargaining Committee and General Electric in Cincinnati, Ohio. Several lead negotiation negotiators are lined up to give us their take on the process. We begin with Conference Board Chair Jerry Carney. Thanks for joining us, Jerry. You're welcome. Good, morning. Good afternoon, I'm sorry. I got my morning and nights mixed up. Well, you've been working hard. That's understandable. You've been negotiating for a couple weeks now. Can you take us through the steps? What happened the first week? The first week was mainly made up of the union giving our proposals to the company and then uh, also the company giving their proposals to the union. And then how did it progress the second week? On the second week, the, a lot of the issues were too big to discuss with a main table where there was 25 or 30 people sitting there. So we broke off into subcommittees with no agreements being made at the subcommittees, everything come back to the table, and we met as a group. No matter what committee you're in, you're part of every committee. So no agreements was ever made, nothing was ever TA'd, unless it come back to the full committee. And what is the status of the negotiations this week? Uh, right now, this week, we're starting into uh, wages and finishing up, trying to get finished up on health care. And it's going to be a trying time this week. So what is your, your best hope uh, that members can expect at the end of this week? Hopefully we'll have a contract and you'll see us come out with a contract. I can tell you one thing, I'm very proud, no matter if you're IM, if you're UAW, if you're Ipsky, uh, if you're U UAW, it doesn't matter which union you are, we're all the same. I'm very proud of them that's been here and hopefully we can come out with a fair contract for everybody and that at the end of this contract we'll all still be here well thank you so much i know you have to get back thanks for keeping us informed jerry thank you well if you're just joining us we're talking to the lead negotiators with the union coordinated bargaining committee in cincinnati ohio several unions are involved joining us now is gary jordan from the uaw thanks for taking time out gary Hi, Tony. Well, why did the retirees feel the need to rally at GE yesterday? Uh, they were compelled to uh, rally to uh, protest. It's their only voice to uh, express themselves in the community or to General Electric. And speaking with some of them, uh, you know, they're frustrated with General Electric. After the last contract, they had their post-65 medical benefits removed. So they feel, and speaking to the retirees, they feel that... Uh, it's a broken promise by General Electric not to sustain those for those retirees. How did the rally itself go? Uh, I'm so proud of them. You know, it was a rainy day. It was nasty. And approximately 200 retirees came out and protested. You know, they wanted to express themselves. So uh, I see that as a big win for them. You know, it's, it's the heart of our retirees that build our future, that put every one of us, include people in management, where they are today. So it was, it was a big day for them, and uh, it was neat to see them come out in the rain and sustain. How much does it mean to all those retirees knowing that you all are out there fighting for those health care benefits? Uh, and speaking with some of them, quite a few of them, you know, they're, uh, they're proud that we would watch over them and try to negotiate benefits for them. You know, but I think the bigger question here is, uh, or more important statement, is what they've done for us. You know, they created the future foundation. They negotiated over numerous contracts.
contracts, that base for that contract. So we could have what we have as far as benefits and, and pensions. And, um, you know, now that they're gone, we are their voice and we're going to speak up for them. Well, thank you for taking time out, Gary, and for all of your hard work. All right, Tony, thank you. That was Gary Jordan, international representative with the United Auto Workers, also known as the International Union, United Automobile, Aerospace, and Agricultural Implement Workers of America. That's the full name. Up next is the IAM's collective bargaining director, Craig Norman. Thanks for joining us, Craig. Hey, good to hear you and see you once again, Tanya. <laughs> no problem. Well, I know this is a complicated process. Can you just break it down for us? How does the negotiation process work when you're dealing with several unions? Well, the process itself is uh, pretty complicated to begin with. And then you add in all these other parties, and including uh, one of the largest employers in probably the world, General Electric. There are a lot of forces at play here. When we sit down and talk about wages, benefits, uh, contract language, and some of the subcommittees that Jerry mentioned earlier, and then all of the issues that are covered in wages and benefits and language, um, everything's up for grabs basically. And we have to, uh, uh, I liken it to uh, playing a game of chess where all the pieces are on springs. So we can move one piece. We can move a piece in pension or we can move a piece in wages and then the chessboard starts to reset with all those pieces under springs. Uh, so it is, a, it is a complicated process, but the idea at the end is to get a complete package that all, our members have an opportunity to understand what, what the package looks like between what they have today, what they're going to get on their paycheck on Friday what health and welfare benefits that they themselves and their families are going to uh, receive throughout that contract. And then also uh, what happens to them when they retire and what do their retirement years look like. So we have to put that whole package together and people need to understand what it is when they vote. All right. How's it going so far? Uh, I would say uh, this is part of the normal process of, you know, decisions aren't really made. The hard, hard decisions are made until the 11th hour. It's kind of like going car shopping, you know, until you get up and leave or until that dealership has to turn off the lights. Uh, that's when the rubber meets the road. So a lot of preparation, a lot of education um, leading up to this time and a lot of organization, getting the membership organized to understand what's going on and understand the points. And then when we get down to the, you know, the brass tacks of what's going to happen over the next couple of days, uh, that's where it all comes together. Well, thank you very much for taking out time out to talk to us, Craig. All right. Thank you, Tanya. Well, that was IM Collective Bargaining Director Craig Norman talking about the negotiation process with several unions working together in solidarity. Our next guest is IBEW Manufacturing Director Randall Middleton. Thanks for joining us, Randall. Good afternoon, Tanya. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. We appreciate you taking out the time for your busy day as well. What is the message from your IBEW members to GE on negotiations? Well, I think the message from IBW members is, is the same as all the CBC members. We're here to get a, a fair, equitable contract for our members who have security in their jobs that they're going to come to work tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. And the fact that we will be here to negotiate the next contract, that's very important. And to maintain the standard of living that our members have been accustomed to while working at GE, now into the future and through our retirement. That, that's the most important message we need to understand. And I think that's something that a lot of people can understand. You know, if you're used to living a certain way and you're able to pay all your bills, you want to maintain that, don't you? Exactly. Well, thank you so much for joining us. That was Randall Middleton, IBEW's director of manufacturing. Up next is the president of Local 147 of the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers, Alex Lanuski. 
Alex, thank you for taking time out. Hello, Tanya. How are you doing? Pretty good. Nice to see you again. <laughs> Alex, in nice your you. view, can you explain the difference in negotiations from 2015 to 2019? Um, and from my point of view, the, uh, the big difference is uh, a few people, you know, individuals at the last uh, contract were doing a lot of the talking. And this, this uh, contract is different in the way that all the unions are having a voice at the main table. So you, you create a lot of unity and solidarity by doing that. So I, it's been a, an awesome experience. How important is that to make sure that everybody has a voice? Because we tell that to our union members every day, and you're living it there. It, it's 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 awesome. I mean, I, you can't put a you can't put a value on it. I'm I'm honored to be here, and it, it does so much having a voice at the table. Because when you have that voice, it just resonates through your entire membership, and uh, it's just, it's awesome. Privilege. Well, we know you all are very busy. You're negotiating all day, every day, and I know you're trying to wrap this up by the end of the week, so we'll let you get back. Um, but thank you and the entire team, all of the lead negotiators, for taking the time out to, to share the process with us. Well, thank you. Well, if you are watching from Ohio, let us know. Join the conversation on YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook. On YouTube, you can use the live chat. On Twitter, just hit the reply button and let us know what you think about contract negotiations. Facebook, see so you have a comment already. Brian Stymax says it's great to see different unions working together. It's too easy to get caught up in our differences. Solidarity is the key to prosperity. I so agree, Brian, and I think we're seeing this in action. Solidarity in action with all of these different unions working together for the good of our members in all of the unions. So you too can comment right now to make your voice heard about the topic of contract negotiations. We'd like to hear from you. Well, here you can comment, like, and share on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. And even during the replay, um, you can comment as well. Well, here's our organizing tip this week. We like to bring you an organizing tip each week, and you can even send in some ideas yourself. Be an influencer on social media. Has the union been there for you and your family? Post about it on social media to spread the word about the benefits of being union. So we're going to leave that up there for a second about being an influencer. And if you guys have any tips, Go ahead and let us know. And if you have a tip that you write in the comments on organizing, perhaps we'll use it in a future show. Well, one man who knows the benefits of being union is IM Canadian Communications Director Bill Turbovich, who is about to retire tomorrow. So Bill joins us live from Toronto, Ontario for one last chat. And I will try not to cry. I'm already crying from the <laughs> AC, though. <laughs> so Bill, you are sitting there in your office. Um, we're going to go way back. When, yeah. when and why did you join the Machinist Union? Uh, it was uh, March of 2004. I was working in retail at the time. And I had worked for a couple other union jobs, but... Uh, those contracts expired. Um, it was a case of I had two job offers in one day, both from different unions. I always had a soft spot for the IAM because when I was a labor reporter and Air Canada was such a big component of the IAM, all their local people were here. And uh, I became good friends with Bill Shippen and Steve Bode and uh, Paul Lefebvre. And uh, when it came time to apply for the job, uh, Bill Shipman brought a bunch of the interviews that I did with him on TV, and he gave them to Dave Ritchie and said, Here, here's the guy you're supposed to hire. So that's how it all got started. Oh, that's wonderful. And it seemed like it was a nice transition for you, and an easy transition, because you were already working and, and dealing with working people. Well, one of the nice things about my job in television, I was a labor reporter, and they asked me, why did you want to do that? And I said, because it's uh, people. And people make good stories, labor people especially. Uh, they're just, you know, everyday folk trying to make a living. And uh, they have a struggle. So, uh, and a lot of the stories I covered during the 90s had to do with free trade. 
Uh, so I was, uh, I got to know quite a few of them because a lot of them lost their jobs and, and suffered uh, setbacks and they, they kept coming back. So that was part of it. Now, Bill is a storyteller, as you know. He has many stories, but I'm going to pick out a few that you may not have heard. There was a severe ice storm of 2013. Tell us about that, Bill. It uh, paralyzed uh, much of southern Ontario and the eastern part of Canada. And what happened was is that the, uh, the tarmac area of Pearson International Airport here in Toronto was so bad that you actually had to use skates to go out to the aircraft. You couldn't hold your balance. And it was so cold out there that when our guys were out trying to move bags and things like that, they were restricted to 15 minutes at a shot. And then they had to come back in and warm up. And what happened was uh, the media came out to the airport because there's disgruntled people that want to get flying places. They can't get their bags. Somebody made mention of the fact that, well, the baggage handlers were not call they were calling in the sick to work. They weren't coming in. And that's why there was a baggage backlog. Rather than talk to us and get the true story, they ran with it, which was totally false. And uh, as a result, uh, my job was to go out to the airport. And I did around, uh, I guess, 15 interviews in the space of two and a half hours, uh, you know, uh, basically getting, it, getting the truth out there. And the original network that uh, spread the false rumor actually had to come back to me and get the truth. And uh, they had heat grow. <laughs> so you set the record straight. You sure did. Here's oh, another one. one. Here's another one for you. Um, consolidated aviation fueling that happened in Toronto and Montreal. What happened there? They had a consortium of airlines that bought their fuel from Consolidated, both in Montreal and Toronto, for over 40 years without a problem. And then the airlines decided they were going to squeeze it to get more money out for their shareholders. So they decided to go to a different supplier. So you have to picture this. We had uh, at least 250 members here in Toronto and about 150 in Montreal. They were making fairly good wages. And then all of a sudden on Friday, you're making out, for example, uh, you're going to buy a new car or you're going to buy a, um, uh, a new house or send your kid to school. On Friday, you had a job. On Monday morning at 9 o'clock, you find out your employer has now changed. The new employer has made a deal with union, which you didn't have any say in. They had to go ahead and take a 35% pay cut. They lost their benefits and they lost their pension and they lost their union. So as a result, our members staged the Wildcat strike and it left a lot of people stranded. Now, once again, uh, you know, we, I, I went out to the airport and said, we don't condone this type of behavior, but put yourself in their shoes. Friday, you got a job, everything looks rosy. Monday, your whole world's turned upside down. What do you expect? And the airlines were saying, well, we're the victims in this, and to which I had one word. I said, bull. Which was true. Once again, you set the record straight. That, that's part of the job that was fun. I mean, uh, there, there's getting out and putting the worker's story forward is uh, not always easy. And, uh, you know, whether it's a strike or a, uh, a, a shutdown or, or a plant closure, whatever the case may be, uh, getting the, the worker's point of view across is, is often difficult, and you really have to hammer away at it. Well, you worked in broadcasting for 30 years, and we have an old photo, so we'd like you to explain oh where this was. What was happening okay, here? Okay, now, <laughs> this, uh, this is, uh, I was a real bull Burma back in the 1970s. This is at CKCO-TV in Kitchener, Ontario, and this was a uh, municipal election. And uh, I was a, a reporter there, uh, slash anchor. And as you can see, I got a lot more hair there than I do now. And I, don't need, I didn't need glasses back then. And uh, that uh, couch throw that looks like a suit jacket, I don't know whatever happened to that. But uh, that was, uh, we, uh, we get together uh, the first Tuesday of every month uh, in Kitchener for uh, retirees and uh, former alumni of CKCO. And one of my friends, Bob Tiffin, sent this photograph. I don't know where he found it. But uh, it's been the source of a lot of uh, chuckles. That is hilarious. You know, I was always taught not to wear patterns on television. You know, stick with the solid colors. And I look back at some of these jackets. That was a classic from the 70s. Well, it was a classic. I mean, you know, there was a nice brown tie and the beige shirt and the and brown pants, but the jacket has to go. I'm not even going to ask what kind of shoes you had on. <laughs> uh, they weren't platforms, I can safely say that. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, there's a story I heard about you being stuck in the bathroom. Yeah, um, when I, uh, my first job in, in uh, radio was in my hometown of Sault Ste. Marie. And the radio and the TV station were housed in the old Bell Canada building. And there was a washroom between the announce booth and the newsroom. And it had rained cats and dogs the night before. Now, as I, I used to go on the air at a quarter to eight in the morning. And um, you would, I would go in and uh, practice my lines sitting on the can before I went in. And unfortunately, uh, the door got stuck because it was warped and the roof leaked. So I'm here in the intro to the sports and I can't get out. So the... Uh, Good friend of mine, Art, Art Osborne, was the morning DJ, and he had the presence of mind to walk into the announce booth, string the cable, put the microphone outside the door in the hallway, and I shouted my sportscast through the door. Now, it may have sounded muffled, and I know it was because I had a good friend of mine. His father worked in Cleveland, Ohio, and he would pull over on a bridge going to work in the morning because our signal boomed right down Lake Huron. And if I made any mistakes, he'd call me, collect, and tell me what they were. So he called me up, collect, and wanted to know why I sounded like I was talking from inside a camp. Because <laughs> you technically kind of were. Because I technically I was, yeah. <laughs> All right, this one is not a laughing matter, but it shows your work ethic because you showed that the show has to go on. You had a boss who actually had a heart attack on the air. What did you do? Yeah. Uh, this was just after... I got him to convince him to go ahead and have copies of everything he read, I would read. So we, didn't, we know we were in the newscast. And I was in what was called the camera two position, which didn't have a, uh, a chroma key behind it. And I was in the middle of reading one of my stories when he had a heart attack. And he killed over right on the desk. And I had to keep on reading while the, uh, the, the station camera crew, they went ahead and locked off the cameras, picked him catered to him, the ambulance came in, put him on a gurney, and took him out of the studio, and I was still reading as they pulled him out of the studio. Wow. Um, was he okay? And beautiful black and white, I mean, I... Oh. We were, yeah, we were the last black and white station in Canada at the time, and that, that's what happened. But uh, he survived. Good. And uh, went on for at least another 35 years. That so. is great. Well, Bill, yeah. you have done so much for our union that I wanted to give you, open mic, any last words that you wanted to say to our members or the people that you've worked with um, or anything you'd like to say about, you know, labor communications um, in Canada? Well, first of all, it's been an honor and a lot of fun. Uh, I've made a lot of friends. <laughs> I'm getting choked up here. But uh, thank you more than anything else. Thanks very much. Oh, Bill, we are just so happy. You got me all teared up, too. Bill was kind enough to tell us some of his stories and about his life in the IAM at our communications conference that took place in Las Vegas. So you can take a look at that show as well. And we are so thankful that he took time, time out to talk to us about his career, both with the IAM and labor communications in Canada, his television career in Canada, um, he's just a good around, good, good, nice guy. So that was Bill Turbovich, the, the IM's Canadian Communications Director, who is retiring in one day. So we'd like everyone to continue wishing him well in the comments. And I guarantee if you ask Bill a question about model trains, he will know the answer. So a fond farewell to Bill Turbovich. Here are some of our events that are coming up. Our special events include the Celebrating Solidarity Awards in Washington, D.C., June 20th at the AFL-CIO headquarters. That's at 815 16th Street in Washington, D.C. That takes place from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. tomorrow night, June 20th. On our calendar, we have registrations due for the following classes. June 24th for retirees assistance, July 22nd, for financial officers, July 29th for both the retiree strategy and the young worker strategy program. For more information, just check the website, wimpasinger.iamaw.org. Our state council meetings coming up, including the Washington Council, I'm losing my voice a little bit, June 20th in Spokane, Texas State Council meets June 28th in Austin. Texas AFL-CIO 60th Convention in San Antonio, July 25th, 
and the Maritime Council of Machinists Biennial Conference in Moncton, New Brunswick, taking place September 27th and 28th. And as far as conferences coming up, Apollo's 15th Biennial Convention will be April, April, August 8th to 11th in Las Vegas. That's Apollo's 15th Biennial Convention. August 15th to the 17th, LACLA's National Conference in Philadelphia. September 8th to the 12th is the International Staff Conference. And before we take this off the screen, that's taking place for the IAM in San Diego. Um, during the beginning of August is also the APRI's convention that's going to be taking place, and that is going to be its 50th anniversary. So, um, a lot going on in August. And be sure to join us next Wednesday when we'll hear from government workers about back pay. There's a rally coming up. Not all the workers got their back pay. We're still fighting for everyone. And you can learn more about the IAM's healthcare organizing. Healthcare is a growing industry, and the IAM is organizing right along with it. So you can join us at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, on this same social media channel. And if you like today's show, please share this video.